Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to give every a uh, couple more minutes to get um, the whole group joined here, and then we'll get started in just one or two minutes. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Uh, my name is Lori Carson. I'm going to be um, hosting this morning and introducing our speakers. Um, we have uh, several topics this morning, and um, we'll go through them one at a time. And they are covering some of the other aspects of the Short Range Weather app other than the core of the model itself. So hopefully this is useful. You'll understand what the whole end-to-end -end system involves and how you can configure it to do uh, the work that you need to get done. Um, I'd like to remind everybody to use the uh, Slack channel if you can to ask questions. Um, that's easier to respond to threads and it keeps a record of the questions longer than the Zoom chat. Uh, Zoom chat's okay though, if that's what works best for you, we'll try to capture those questions as well. Um, let's see. So our first uh, speaker this morning is Lin Lin Pan, and he will be talking about the CCPP physics. Uh, we haven't talked about this too much. There's another talk tomorrow afternoon that goes more in depth. Uh, this is a method of uh, integrating physics parameterizations into a numerical weather prediction model. And um, there, so Linlin's going to describe the physics suites that are supported by the short range weather app and um, describe um, how they're used in the model. Um, and then tomorrow we'll talk more about the, um, the me mechanics of using CCPP if you have interest in that. Okay, that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions before we get started? You can raise hand or uh, enter them in Slack or in the chat, sorry. Okay, Lin Lin, it's all yours. Thanks, Laurie. Hi, everyone. I'm Lin Lin Pan from uh, Low RGSL uh, at DTC. So I, as Laurie, Laurie mentioned, I will uh, give an overview of CCPB physics uh, with focusing on the supported uh, physics suites in UFS the rainy weather application 1.0 uh, CCPP as we all know stands for a uh, common community physics package. Uh, here is the outline of the presentation. Uh, the short range weather application V1.0 uh, supported the physics suites and uh, physics related lamnist option will be introduced at the beginning followed by time integration within physics suites and the overview of selected uh, physics schemes. Here is an, uh, an example of uh, CCPP uh, suite. A CCPP suite is a set of uh, physics schemes. The suite definition file, SDF, is a uh, ASCII file with XML format and uh, describes the schemes that will be used in a, a model run. As uh, Laurie mentioned, uh, we will have more uh, detailed discussion on the CCPP uh, in tomorrow's presentation. So I will not talk uh, more about this at this uh, presentation. 
So uh, current uh, CCPP uh, supported physics suite, there are two uh, physics suites supported in current release. One is previously operational GFS V15P2. Uh, the, the other is uh, experimental RFS V1 alpha. So uh, GFS uh, V15P2 has uh, microphysics GFDL, Macrophysics, then KEDMF, uh, PBL schemes, GFS surface layer, SS uh, deep convection, SS uh, shallow convection, RTMG radiation schemes, UGWP gravity wave drag uh, physics, uh, lower nano surface model, then uh, GSST and SST. Uh, GFS and SST Ocean. For the RFS V1 Alpha, we have uh, Thomson Macrophysics, MIN EDMF, uh, PBL scheme. Uh, then you have GFS uh, surface layer. For deep convection, we uh, is turned off. For resolution uh, equal or higher than three kilometers, you can turn off deeper convection. If you want to use this scheme to do low resolution uh, simulation, like 13 kilometer, 25 kilometer, then you may need to turn on the deeper uh, convection. Then shallow convection, you have MIN EDMF uh, for the uh, PBL uh, shallow uh, cloud. Then radiation, you also use RTMG uh, scheme same uh, gravity wave jack. Uh, the nano surface model use lower MP, a uh, slight different from GFS V15P2. The ocean part is same, use the GFS and SST. So this is our, our two supported uh, physics uh, suites. So here is the direct connections of parameterization uh, in the model. Uh, the cumulus can influence the macro uh, physics through cloud uh, detriment can influence the radiations through the convective cloud fraction, then influence uh, the surface through convective rain, rain. Then the macrophysics can impact the radiations through the cloud effects. Radiation interacts with the surface through long-wave radiation and the short-wave radiation. Then macrophysics uh, in, interact with surface through long convective rain. Then the PBL on the surface can all, also interact through latent heat uh, release, sensible heat release, uh, surface uh, two meter temperature, two meter specific humidity, 10 meter uh, wind. Physics related name list options uh, in the file input dot nml, you can find the uh, include GFS uh, physics name list, GFDL cloud macrophysics name list, Cirrus uh, UGWP name list, stochastic name list. Here is the uh, documentation of the uh, CCPP. So in CCPP documentation, you can find the detailed description of all this uh, name list. You can also find the, uh, at the appendix of this presentation, they have some uh, detailed description of all this uh, physics uh, name list. Here is the time uh, integration. Uh, you may already uh, saw this uh, figure in uh, Lucas' talk yesterday. Here, I want to more emphasize uh, the uh, physics in this uh, remapping. So you can see the slow, slow physics at the main loop, also the fast physics at the uh, green part related to the uh, saturation adjustment. So. Uh, from the main loop, yellow, then the remapping Lagrange to Ola loop, uh, green and uh, acoustic loop, blue. If we use a uh, three kilometer uh, resolution, the main loop, you can set uh, 40 seconds. Then the green part, it's uh, say it's 20. 
seconds, then the for acoustic uh, time step is like a uh, uh, four uh, second. Here is the time integration. Uh, so the uh, tendencies from different physics processes are computed by parameter generation or derived in separate interstitial uh, uh, routines. From the uh, dynamics, in, in the dynamic, then you may also have the GFDL macrophysics faster process like uh, uh, saturation adjustment. Then physics done include the surface layer, turbulence down, radiation, aerosols, and other processes, then surface coupling, land model, ice model, ocean model, then through the uh, physics app, microphysics, shallow convection, microphysics, deep convection, and the PBL uh, turbulence, then come back to dynamics. For example, when you have solar radiation comes down, it will uh, interact with the surface, then come back to the convection, then influence the uh, dynamics. So it's a, a cycle. Here is an example of a uh, sweet definition file, RFS uh, V1 alpha uh, physics uh, suite. So we uh, start from the radiation, then to the uh, surface, uh, to uh, gravity of jack, then to the uh, macrophysics. So it can separate in two parts. The first part is called uh, uh, process splitting. Uh, in, this, in this part, all the parameterization operate on the same uh, model uh, state. Then the second part is called a sequential splitting. The uh, parameterization are called when following each other with the uh, updated model uh, state. Here is an uh, example of the uh, sequential uh, radiation calculation, the first part of the uh, physics uh, suite. So the processing as uh, splitting, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, on the same uh, model state. So you start from the radiation reset, then prepare to the short wave uh, prepare then short wave radiation calculation, the post, then the long wave uh, radiation calculate, then the whole program post. For this part, you uh, include the radiation surface layer, uh, surface uh, like land, ocean, sea ice, boundary layer, orographic gravity wave drag, and uh, really uh, damping parameterization. All these uh, schemes are belong to the process uh, splitting. The second part uh, is the sequential or time splitting. The parameters are called one after another and each parameters operates on an updated, updated model state. Includes the uh, ozone, stratospheric water vapor, convective gravity wave drag, deep shallow convection, and the macrophysics uh, parameterization. So uh, here uh, is the overview of all the selected uh, physics schemes, which include uh, the first part is radiation and ozone water vapor physics. Uh, so the scheme use RTMG short wave and long wave radiation scheme. The ozone photochemistry use 2015 NIL uh, version. Uh, similarly for the stratospheric uh, uh, water vapor scheme. Then the low boundary condition and the coupling, which include the uh, sea surface, uh, ocean, sea ice, surface layer, uh, parameter violation. We use NSST schemes, also uh, three layer sea ice model uh, and the GFS uh, surface layer schemes. The land surface model include the lower land surface model or the lower uh, MP and uh, surface model. The PBL have uh, two uh, schemes in this uh, two supported uh, suites. 
one is uh, GF, uh, GFS hybrid EDMF uh, scheme. The other is MYN EDMF. Uh, for the graveyard wave drive, we use uh, UGWP uh, V0 uh, for both orographic and learn orographic graveyard uh, wave drive. Cumulus parameter analysis, uh, uh, we use GFS scale uh, OL simplified Arakawa Schmidt called SA, SAS. SA means uh, scale aware, uh, deep convection and shallow convection. So for the uh, RFS wave alpha, as I mentioned earlier, it's turned off. So if you want to uh, use it in the low resolution simulation, you may need to turn on uh, that uh, deep convection and the shallow convection schemes. For the macrophysics, we included uh, two macrophysics. One is GFDL uh, cloud macrophysics scheme. The other is uh, Thomson macro a physical scheme. Uh, also, uh, we'll talk about the scale aware and the precipitation type diagnosis schemes. Uh, we also will give a brief uh, introduction on the stochastic physics. Uh, on each topic, I, I think you can give um, one presentation. So in this presentation, I try to give a very uh, brief introduction uh, mainly focus on how these schemes are used in the model. So let's look at the radiation scheme first. Uh, radiation scheme, we use RRTMG uh, long wave radiation V uh, 2.3 and RRTMG uh, short wave uh, radiation V uh, 2.3. Uh, the algorithm uh, includes major and minor ab absorbing uh, gas. Uh, like carbon dioxide, ozone, methane, uh, water vapor. Uh, the scheme interacts with resolved uh, model cloud fields like liquid and ice uh, particles. Uh, interacts with aerosol supplied by uh, climatology. A uh, Monte Carlo independent column of simulation methods is used to represent a statistical and resolved subgrade. Uh, scale. So this uh, radiation package provides a fast, accurate method to determine the total radiative flux at any uh, given uh, column. So this is the uh, uh, detail of the uh, model uh, on the radiation scheme that have uh, eight modules. The first is a dry module propels astronomy parameters, atmosphere profile, and the surface conditions. Then as uh, astronomy module obtains parameters, local, uh, thermal, uh, zenith angle. Then aerosol module establish the aerosol profile and the optical property. Gas module set up absorbing gas profile like ozone, carbon dioxide, and methane and other rare gases. Cloud module prepare uh, cloud profiles. Surface module set up surface albedo and the emissivity. Short wave radiation module uh, computes short wave flux and heating rates uh, due to the short wave. Then long wave radiation module computes long wave flux and uh, heating rates. So uh, now let's look at the NRL ozone physics chemistry. Uh, 2015 version. We use this uh, version to calculate the ozone um, photochemical production and loss. Uh, as we all know, more accurate assimilator of uh, satellite radiations uh, rely on the ozone uh, profile. Uh, it's very important uh, to have a better ozone representing under the uh, stratosphere to improve the wind analysis uh, at the uh, upper and the low uh, stratosphere. So here is the uh, equation for the uh, lead uh, ozone photochemical tendency of ozone mixing rate. Uh, P is the production, then L is the loss. So P minus L is the difference between production and the loss. 
uh, then R is uh, ozone mixing ratio, T is temperature, uh, sigma is the overhead ozone column amount. As we all know, ozone profile has a maximum at around uh, 22 kilometer. It's uh, in the stratosphere. So the upper layer ozone column amount also has contributed to the tendency of ozone mixing ratio change. Uh, the monthly and the zonal mean uh, ozone production and loss rate uh, are used uh, uh, in the model. So the equation are separated, linearized into uh, four terms. The fourth, fourth term is the um, monthly and the zonally mean term, then the change with ozone mixing uh, ratio, change with uh, temperature, then change with overhead ozone uh, column amount. Uh, similarly, we also use uh, the uh, NIL stratospheric uh, uh, water vapor scheme to calculate water vapor photochemical production and uh, uh, loss. So uh, it's also very important uh, to represent the stratospheric water vapor um, correctly. It's uh, for the radiation calculation. Here is the equation for the NIL uh, stratospheric uh, water vapor scheme. They have uh, two terms. Uh, one is the monthly and the zonally mean uh, water vapor production and the loss rate. Uh, this is given uh, from the NIL uh, CAM 2D uh, model. Then change with the uh, uh, specific humidity, Q is the specific humidity here. Uh, they don't have the uh, overhead term because uh, as we all know at the up layer, the uh, sp uh, water vapor tend to close to a uh, zero. The big source is at the surface and the low level. So let's look at the, uh, the low boundary condition and the uh, Happening, which includes the two parts. The first part is uh, sea surface, uh, ocean, sea ice, surface layer uh, parameterization. Uh, the first we will talk about the GFS layer surface uh, sea temperature scheme or NSST. Then the sea ice scheme and the surface layer scheme. The land surface model, as I mentioned earlier, we include the lower land surface model uh, in the GFS V15P2 and the lower MP in RIFS V1 alpha. The SST is required in a, a numerical weather a system as a low uh, boundary conditions. Also, it's important for LC uh, interaction. Um, it can be uh, come from climatology, observation, regulated data sets, or from full ocean model uh, coupling. Uh, it can also use uh, the NSST uh, scheme to get it. Uh, in the UFS short range weather application, the SST can change uh, because it's forced toward the climatology. So this is the NSST, this uh, scheme equation, uh, you have a climatology part, you have 90 days uh, uh, e-folding time, uh, also has other uh, terms. So this is the uh, more detailed uh, equation for the NSST uh, schemes. Uh, NSST can reproduce the influence of uh, dino thermocline layer warming also the thermal skin uh, layer cup, uh, cooling. So it uh, can have uh, two parts. One is diurnal uh, cycle, the other is uh, skin uh, effect. So can influence uh, the system's uh, temperature uh, changes.
So uh, TF here is a uh, uh, foundation uh, temperature. It is a lot less uh, variable. Then the diurnal warming uh, profile, it's normally about uh, uh, five meters. Then TC prime, it's uh, the skin. It's very uh, shallow one. Then uh, ZW is diurnal warming layer thickness. Then the uh, data C is a subsurface coolant layer uh, thickness. So this is NSST scheme. For the short range weather uh, application, we can also uh, use the observed SST. Uh, for the longer one, like S2S, they use a coupled model, uh, all included in the UFS uh, system. Then the uh, GFS uh, CI scheme, this is a, a three layer uh, thermodynamics uh, model. Uh, it's included the up layer, snow, up ice, low ice. So it's three layer. Um, it can predict sea ice, slow thickness, surface temperature, ice temperature uh, structures. In each grid box, the heat and the moisture flux and the albedo are treated separate for the ice and the open water. So this is a, a schematics of the surface uh, uh, sea ice uh, scheme. So this is a, a GFS surface layer uh, scheme. It's based on money over half similarity profile uh, relationship to calculate the uh, surface stress, roughness, then exchange uh, coefficient. Uh, CM is for uh, momentum, then CH for heat flux. Uh, so best uh, money of similarity, you get uh, all this uh, equation. Uh, the uh, formula also be updated with uh, the new vegetation dependent formulation uh, of the thermal roughness uh, formation to deal with uh, uh, surface uh, conditions. Also introduced a stable um, parameter constraint. So this uh, equation. Then now let's look at the uh, land surface model. Uh, land surface model, we have uh, uh, two land surface models will be introduced. One is uh, lower, the other is lower uh, MP. Land surface model provide boundary conditions for heat momentum. Uh, so it's uh, very important. Um, for the surface uh, energy and the water budget. Now let's look at the lower and uh, the surface model. It's a uh, uh, four uh, soil. It has four soil layers. Use uh, soil prognostic equation to calculate surface energy, water budget, also uh, surface soil temperature, uh, canopy water content, snow packs, water equivalent, uh, or uh, kinds of surface uh, variables. Then uh, lower uh, MP. So the lower MP is slightly uh, different from the uh, lower, uh, it has a, a single layer um, color P, four layer uh, soil also has a, a three layer slope. Uh, the subgrid skill uh, use uh, semi tile vegetation and the bare soil. Interact energy balance method is used to predict the uh, skin temperature of the canopy and the slow soil surface. Modified uh, um, two stream radiation transfer scheme is adopted to mimic the three dimension structure of the canopy. It has more realistic uh, uh, slow uh, physics. It also includes a top model best runoff scheme. Uh, uh, an unconfined aquifer interaction with the soil, more uh, realistic uh, 
surface conditions also include a short-term uh, leaf uh, dynamics model. It also has the uh, underground uh, water charge, recharge. So here is a, a simple comparison of these uh, two uh, schemes. Uh, both has a four layer soil. Uh, lower has a single layer slope pack. Uh, lower MP has three layers. Then canopy in lower, it use a grid uh, vegetation friction. In each grid, they use vegetation fraction. In lower MP, you have a, a layer uh, canopy. Then lower MP also include the uh, leaf dynamic model. Uh, it has groundwater uh, charge, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, for this figure, you have the low layer, but for lower, uh, you don't have that part. So this is a, a simple comparison of the uh, two uh, schemes. Now, now let's look at the uh, PBL. Uh, uh, they have uh, two uh, PBL schemes uh, supported in uh, UFS short range weather application V1.0. The first one is GFS uh, hybrid EDMF or AD deficiency mass flux PBL. The other is MYN EDMF. So this is a, a simple equation. Uh, example. So the turbulence uh, flux include the two parts. One is the AD diffusivity called the ED. Then the other part is mass flux for the uh, convection or unstable uh, PBL uh, called the MF. So mass flux put together called the uh, EDFL. So the main task of the PBL scheme is to calculate the tendency of temperature, moisture, and momentum due to vertical diffusion, uh, turbulence uh, mixing. So let's look at the, the GFS, uh, GFS hybrid EDMF PBL uh, scheme uh, first. Uh, the mass flux or MF scheme uh, for the strong and stable PBL uh, case I uh, used. Uh, also the ED or ED diffusivity scheme for the weak and stable uh, PBL scheme. Then the uh, first order turbulent transfer the scheme uh, for the stable uh, PBL. It also using the PBL height similarity parameters, uh, diffusion coefficients, um, below the PBL top and the level ob above the PBL top with updated Richardson number dependent functions. Uh, if the PBL is diagnosed as stratus uh, cumulus topped diffusion co uh, coefficients are modified. Uh, the heating uh, due to TKE dissipation also uh, updated in the uh, used the in the later version. Now let's look at the MYN uh, EDMF. Uh, MYN, it's uh, actually this um, name come from the four person's lamp. M is the Bello, Y is the Yamada, then uh, two N is two uh, people started from N, one is called Lake Nishi, the other is called Lilo. So Put the four person together, it's MYN, then EDMF. ED is added deficiency. This is the second order uh, closure. In terms of TKE, they may have a different level, so called. When Melo and Yamada publish their paper, they call the level uh, 2.5. Then uh, the another two person has uh, some improvement to the system like 2.6 or even 3.0. But in general, they are called uh, second order closure. Then the mass flux, uh, they use dynamic spectral multi uh, model. Uh, it has moist conserved variables. Uh, use cloud probability 
distribution functions to represent the both stratus and the convective subscales uh, clouds. The impact on turbulence mixing uh, are considered. There are also uh, other uh, distinguished aspects. Uh, Include the mass flux is designed to parameterize all the local mixing in all environments. Uh, and represent all the impacts of shallow uh, uh, cumulus in the uh, PBL. So, this is a, a simple comparison of these uh, two uh, schemes. The, GFS uh, hybrid EDMF and the MRN uh, F. So GFS uh, ED, uh, ED added deficiency can be one order one or 1.5 because uh, in the latter version, they use uh, the TKE uh, to calculate the K, the diffusivity part. Then MRN uh, is a second order closure. In terms of uh, a TKE may you have a level 2.5 or 2.6 or even uh, 3, but they are all belong to a second order closure. Then mass flux, they use uh, two uh, versions. One is from the uh, SEPSMA uh, 2007, and uh, MIN use LEGAS 2015. Uh, there are other features difference. Uh, MIN has cloud uh, probability distribution functions. It's a uh, scale uh, well. So this is a, a comparison of the uh, two uh, PBL schemes. Then, now let's look at the gravity drug. Uh, the gravity drug includes uh, two parts. One is uh, orographic uh, gravity drug, gravity forcing. Uh, for example, the mountains can produce uh, forcing uh, to the atmosphere, uh, so-called mountain talk, uh, also excite the uh, stationary uh, gravity waves, larger scale gravity wave. Then also known orographic uh, forcing like uh, convection, mean like the uh, storm track and the uh, jet interaction. Um, they also have uh, a lot of scheme called the really damping. It's introduced to mimic the viscous or friction dissipation uh, in the at atmosphere. So uh, in the support to support the suites, they both use uh, UGWPV0. Uh, this uh, scheme identify a gravity uh, propagation for both uh, orographic and the non orographic uh, um, gravity waves. The orographic gravity wave mainly uh, mimics the uh, mountain effect. Uh, this is a simple uh, equation. Tau is the stress, rho is the density, U is the uh, uh, speed. Then GF is the uh, function of the uh, fluid number. Then delta X is the uh, uh, horizontal scale. Uh, N is brown by solar frequency. So it's uh, uh, calculate the subgrid scale mountain blocking and calculate the orographic uh, wave, uh, wave drag. So this is uh, orographic gravity wave drag. The other uh, part is the learn orographic with uh, drugs. This part mainly uh, reflects uh, the imbalance of the convection, also the front and the jet dynamics to interact with uh, uh, mean flow. Also the troposphere and the stratosphere interaction. Um, in this scheme, a modification of uh, Sonoka 2003 scheme uh, for NGWS with learn hydrostatic and the rotational effects of gravity propagation uh, background dissipation is uh, used. 
now let's look at the uh, cumulus parameterization. Cumulus parameterization includes the uh, two types. One is uh, deep, uh, the other is uh, shallow convection. Uh, as we all know, the model uh, does a lot of, uh, has high resolution sometimes due to the computation limitation. So that have many uh, subgrade scale convection cannot be solved by model. So we have used this kind of uh, parameterization to mimic the subscale uh, heat, moisture, and the momentum uh, transport. Uh, the main function of the cumulus parameterization has uh, three parts. The first part is determine when and where if the uh, convection occurs use so-called trigger function. The other is the vertical momentum, heat and the moisture transport uh, is redistributed really based on the cloud model. Uh, the cumulus parameterization also provides the amount uh, or intensity of the convection use uh, closure assumption. One thing I need to want to emphasize is for high resolution, for example, the horizontal scale is equal or smaller than three kilometer. We can uh, turn off the cumulus parameterization. That's why we don't have the uh, cumulus parameterization turned on in the RFS B1 alpha. In, uh, let's look at the GFS uh, scale aware mass flux uh, deep uh, convection scheme. Uh, this is uh, an updated uh, version of simplified Arakawa Schmidt uh, SAS uh, scheme with scale and uh, aerosol aware. Uh, it has uh, three uh, key uh, features. One is the cloud mass decrease with increased uh, grid uh, resolution. Then rain uh, con conversion in the convective uh, object is modified by Arthur number uh, concentration. Then the closure is scale aware. Uh, what does that mean? It means if the cloud based mass flux uh, is, uh, uh, when the horizontal scale is greater uh, than eight, they use cloud based mass flux based on equilibrium. When the scale is smaller than eight kilometers, they will use uh, uh, another function based on the mean uh, abject velocity. So the basic concept is from Arakawa Schmidt, but they have modifications uh, with uh, others, for example, Grail 1993. Um, it's con uh, considered the uh, uh, saturated uh, condition and uh, other cloud types. The scheme includes the calculation of uh, cloud top with abject cloud model entrainment and the detriment, improve the convective transport of horizontal momentum, and more general triggering function and the inclusion of convective over shooting. Uh, similarly, the uh, shallow convection also use uh, uh, same scheme, but it's, it's have some uh, key difference. When is the cloud-based mass flux is parameterized, use mean, a mean abject velocity averaged over the whole cloud, cloud depth, low quiver equilibrium assumption used for any grid size. Uh, cloud model without a convective uh, downdraft, shallow convection starts at the level of maximum moisture static energy within uh, PBL. Uh, entrainment rates are larger than the, in the deep uh, convection scheme. The cloud top combined to below the level where the pressure is equal 70% uh, of surface pressure. So now let's look at the macrophysics. Uh, the two macrophysics schemes, one is cloud uh, JDL, cloud macrophysics schemes. Uh, the other is Thompson macro uh, uh, cloud physics. Uh, we also talk about the uh, cloud fraction in FV3 dynamical 
and the scale awareness of the GFDL cloud macro physics. Then talk about the GFS precipitation type, type diagnosis. So it's how do we decide it's rain or snow based on, on the uh, temperature. So let's look at the GFDL cloud macro physics schemes. It's a single momentum uh, six category macro physics. It includes the faster physics. Um, first change and the latent uh, heating are embedded within the Langlangi to Ola remapping in the FA3 dynamical and can be updated more rapidly. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, schematics of the FV3 uh, remapping part. The total moist energy is precisely conserved within the cloud macrophysics. So this is a schematics of the GFDL cloud macrophysics uh, schemes. Uh, it's, uh, six, uh, it has six uh, species, cloud water, uh, cloud ice, water vapor, snow, uh, hail and gravel, uh, also the rain. Uh, so the green line uh, without latent heat release or absorption, for example, when you change from cloud water to rain, you don't have the latent heat release. However, the red line with latent heat release or absorption, for example, you uh, evaporation from rain to water vapor lead to absorb the, the energy. Mm, then if the condensation from water vapor uh, to snow or other uh, ice type uh, or rain, then you have uh, latent heat release. The GFDL macrophysic cloud fraction, uh, so uh, it depends on the mass of uh, vapor, QV, then liquid and the soil water, uh, as well as the saturated specific uh, humidity. There is one variable, HVAR. Uh, Here, it's, this is the horizontal subgrid uh, variable. Uh, so it's a function of a grid. So uh, here you, you can see the uh, detailed uh, definition of this uh, HVAR it's over land and the ocean. So it depends on the uh, grid scale. Uh, so based on this uh, variable, so it's a scale or well. So different, the variable depends on different scale, then you can change the uh, scheme. So that's so-called a scale. Uh, dependent or scale aware. Uh, now let's look at the macro, uh, Thomson macrophysics. Uh, so it has uh, different colors. The red one means eye process, ice process involving uh, grapple. Uh, then the uh, deep blue is ice process in, involving uh, slow. Then light uh, blue. Uh, means liquid process in, involving rain. So that includes the deposition, sublimation, rimming, evaporation, condensation, also ice multiplication, aggregation, uh, accretion, uh, super cooled water formation. So it's uh, uh, Thomson macro uh, physics. Then the GFS uh, precipitation tiger dialogue diagnosis. Basically, the, it's based on the uh, uh, dew point uh, profile, also the surface temperature. So uh, when the surface temperature is uh, below zero, then you have ice or slow or grapple. So the, this model uh, can define the uh, precipitation type. Uh, to uh, provide uh, to the model. Uh, it can also be an input for the uh, non-surface uh, model. Here is a simple comparison for the GFDL macrophysics and the Thomson macrophysics. Uh, for GFDL macrophysics, they have the cloud ice, cloud water, rain, snow, 
grapple hair uh, water vapor. Then for Tom Thompson skin that also has cloud ice, cloud water, rain, snow, grapple hair, water vapor. They also included the number of concentration. Also, it, it is uh, aerosol friendly. Then for scale aware, the JBL macrophysics is scale aware. Thompson uh, currently does not have that uh, uh, function. Uh, however, Thompson is aerosol aware. Uh, JBL macrophysics does not that have that uh, part. So now let's look at the stochastic uh, physics. As we all know, the model, you know, uh, it's the scale uh, sometimes cannot resolve the subgrid scale, such as a uh, convection, also other uh, processes. So it lead to uh, characterize uh, or uh, mimic all this kind of uh, subgrid scale uh, unresolved process. So that's uh, why stochastic physics uh, are introduced uh, to simulate the dynamic effects of unresolved scale um, processes. So here is uh, uh, three uh, stochastic uh, schemes. The first one is called the SKEB, uh, Stochastic Kinetic Energy Backscattering. Uh, this scheme mainly for uh, address the errors in the dynamics more active in the mid latitude. So as we all know in the mid latitude, the storm track and the jet interaction. Uh, however, due to the model uh, grid scale, sometimes we cannot resolve uh, this uh, process better. So that's why I introduce uh, this uh, SKEB scheme to add wind perturbation to model state. Uh, perturbations are random in space and time, uh, then to determine by uh, the smooth dissipation estimate by the uh, dynamic core. Um, the second uh, scheme is SPPT, uh, stochastic perturbation physics tendencies address the errors in the uh, physics parameterization uh, most active in the uh, uh, boundary layer, also the convective uh, regions. Um, it's for the physics tendency by a random between zero to one uh, before update the model uh, state. The third scheme called SHUM uh, specified the uh, perturbation uh, attempt to address missing uh, physics process more active in convective uh, region. Uh, it multiple the low level specific humidity by a small random number uh, each uh, time step. So uh, here's a summary of the uh, CCPP supported uh, suites or schemes uh, in uh, UFSB. Uh, UFS short range weather IPPB when point zero. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, each physics you can give one talk uh, to talk all the details. I try to uh, give a very, very brief uh, introduction to all these schemes used in the model. Um, so uh, here is a summary. We have two supported uh, uh, suites, one is GFS V15 uh, P2. This is previously uh, operational uh, suite. Uh, currently we use uh, GFS V16 uh, in the operational. Then RFS V1 alpha is an uh, experimental uh, scheme. The deep convection part of the use uh, GFS V15 P2 use SAS best uh, mass flux deep convection. Uh, it's scale aware. Uh, then the shallow convection is SIS, mm, similar to uh, deeper convection, that have, but they have uh, some uh, differences. For RFS V1 alpha, it's uh, turned off. Uh, though if you wanted to use uh, for low resolution, 
like 13 or 25 kilometers, you may need to turn on uh, this part. Uh, then for macrophysics, you have uh, GFDL macrophysics uh, for GFSV 15P2. Then for RFSV, when you use uh, Thomson uh, physics, uh, macrophysics scheme, it's also aware. One thing I want to emphasize, RFSV when is uh, uh, original from the wrapper hood suite. Uh, so currently Wolf model is uh, the wrap hood suite is uh, something similar uh, to RFS weaving alpha uh, suite. Then the PBL use hybrid EDMF uh, PBL. Then the RFS weaving alpha use MLN uh, EDMF. Uh, the radiation they use same or both use RITMG uh, V.2.3. Then the same surface layer, the land surface model are slightly different. One is lower, the other is lower MP. Lower MP uh, has better uh, slow representation, also has underground uh, water uh, recharge. They have same, same uh, gravity uh, drug model. Uh, yeah, the other part also uh, similar. I think that's all. Uh, any questions or comments? Thanks very much, Lynn. And that's a lot of detailed information for everybody. Um, these slides will be uh, available after the tutorial so everybody can download them and review. Um, there was one question in the chat from Bill Bua. Would you like to um, bring up your question now, Bill? Sure. Um, basically, I was wondering about uh, the trans any transition, and I presume you'd need one, uh, between the, uh, oh, what was it? The, I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was involving the uh, uh, cumulus parameterization scheme. In the scale aware section where there was uh, one thing done for eight kilometers and, or, or greater and another thing done for eight kilometer, less than eight kilometers, yes. Oh uh, no, we keep going. Sorry about that. But I was wondering if there was a transition where you'd use part, you know, some sort of a ratio of one to the other to uh, not have a shock in the, in the system, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, they have a transition. Maybe I don't uh, explain clear because it's, <laughs> it's a shock it. clock. Yeah. It's All clear, right. right? This one. Yes, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, they have some kind of uh, some kind ramp. of experience. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some sort of ramping function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I figured yeah. it had to be, or else it would make a mess. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, there were several good questions and discussions in the um, Slack channel. Uh, so since we're running a little bit behind, I will um, not go over those. Unless, does anybody else have a question to bring up to the group now? Hi, uh, this is Jiri from uh, EMC. I have a question. Uh, so uh, in the CCPV definition file, there's a uh, some some schemes, say surface schemes caught more than once. Uh, so sub subcycling is two. Is there a particular reason for that? So for instability or other reasons? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, for sub cycle. So uh, it's uh, like a, a time splitting. So you can have uh, more uh, cycle. This means you have a shorter time scale. One thing we are doing is, uh, for example, for Thomson schemes. So you have uh, in, increased the cycle time. Let's say you cycle twice, then it means you have a shorter uh, time steps. It makes the system more stable. So the same for the surface? Uh, yes, for some variable, yeah, yes. Thanks. Okay, I think with that, we'll move on to our next presentation. Um, this next topic is the NSEP libraries. Kyle Gerheiser from EMC will be telling us all about this. This is an infrastructure piece used by the Short Range Weather app 
And on Cheyenne, they're pre-built for you, so you didn't have to really think about them while you were doing your practical sessions. But if you want to install this app on your own platform at some point in the future, you will need to know this. So um, Kyle, go ahead if you're ready to share your screen. Sure, one second. Okay. Yeah. All right. How does that look? You see my screen? Um, you're not sharing your screen yet, Kyle. Oh. Oh, I have to click share. Okay, now if you go look. full screen for us. Yep. How's right, that? Awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So I'm here to talk about NCEP libs and their associated external libraries you need to uh, build the UFS weather model uh, and all, you know, I guess the short range weather app as well. Um, so let's get started. Um, so there's a lot of NCEP libs. We have a collection of about 15 internally developed libraries and utilities that are used by um, all these applications. And they do things like provide model IO and grid transformation and interpolation, et cetera. Um, they're all Fortran mostly, a little bit of C. Uh, as part of our public release, which you are a part of, um, we added a CMake build system and updated our um, libraries so they'd be easier to, to, to distribute. Um, and they're on GitHub, if anyone ever wants to take a look. Um, and most users can treat NCEP libs as a black box. Uh, as was stated, uh, on all the supercomputers, there are all such a Cheyenne, they're already pre-installed. Um, but if you do want to build it on your um, you know, home system, uh, you will have to install them. Um, so this is the library hierarchy. Um, so you have all these external libraries, which are basically NetCDF, ESMF, Jasper, and a couple others. And then, uh, then you build NCEP libs, and then you can finally build and run your, uh, you know, your UFS short range weather app or the weather model or whatever. Oops. Um, so. We have this thing called NCEP libs external, which is the external part of these libraries. Um, and that'll, it's a CMake wrapper around um, all these libraries. It'll install Zlib, HDF5, and all these here. Um, and then you can configure this and it also provides some simple LMOD modules in case you wanna do it like that. Um, and then here are the actual libraries that is part of NCEP libs. And you don't really have to know what these are, but just a, just a you know, simple example of what, the, what each one of them does. So you get lots of IO and grid encoding and interpolation. And you know we have to do binary IO and uh, Surface IO and all these other things. Um, and there's GRIB libraries to handle GRIB decoding, GRIB1 and GRIB2. Um, and then you have some others for interpolation and spectral transformations. And these, this is just a picture of all the libraries and how they interact with each other. Um, so it would be kind of uh, confusing to build all this by hand. So uh, that's why we have this uh, CMake build system and this uh, NCEP libs umbrella build, which will build everything for you, uh, much as that NCEP libs external builds all the necessary external packages. And um, 
the benefit of the CMake build that we have is that it provides uh, these package configs so you can easily link them into your CMake build, uh, which is what everything we've transitioned to. Um, and then there's here's that NCEP libs umbrella build, um, which builds all the uh, NCEP libraries for you. Um, you just need a Fortran and a C compiler and uh, have built the NCEP libs external with all those external libraries. And then um, you can get this on GitHub and it's really easy to build. Um, clone it, check it out. You run CMake and then run make and uh, give it the path to your um, NCEP libs external and uh, that'll do it for you. Um, oh. Uh, I had I think I'm using some uh, mixed up slides here, but uh, let me. Sorry about that. Oops. Sorry, everyone, but here we go. Let me get back to my spot. So and then there's, uh, I talked about NCEP libs and NCEP libs external to build the libraries. And that's what we included for the uh, short range weather app release. But in the meantime, we've kind of changed how we build our libraries internally. And we have this, um, you know, poor man's package manager called HPC stack, which is a shell script based building system um, for uh, our NOAA applications. It's a one stop shop. So it gives you, you know, HDF5, NetCDF, ESMF, as well as NCEP libs and other libraries that um, may be useful for, um, you know, earth science community. Um, and hey, Kyle, we, I don't think we're seeing your slides. No. Uh, seeing. Oh, sorry. It stopped sharing, it looks like. We can see just a, an empty HP stack slide. Sorry, let me... You need to hit full screen again. Did you do you see it now? Or is it just a blank? No, slide I try resume. There we go. Do you that see it now? Better. Yep. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. OK, so we have this shell script based um, you know, build scripts. It works on. HPC systems, it works on Linux, Ubuntu, Mac OS. Um, and we keep it up to date for the develop branch of the UFS weather model. Uh, and it also, you can um, have your own Lua or actually, yeah, your own uh, LMOD modules uh, if you want to install it on an HPC system. Um, and this, it's a uh, very simple to build. I clone it. Uh, edit some config files, uh, choose what you want to build, uh, set fever modules if you want to use modules and then um, build the stack. Um, and you can find uh, detailed instructions for all these on uh, NSUP libs external, NSUP libs, HPC stack. Um, and we're also uh, looking into SPAC, if anyone has ever heard of that. Uh, it's a uh, package manager uh, developed by uh, Lawrence Livermore, I believe. And uh, a lot of HPC centers are using it 
and we are currently in the process of porting our libraries to SPAC. So um, keep an eye out for that. And we are very active on GitHub if anyone ever has any questions or issues. So um, that's all I have. Any questions? Um, I don't see any questions in the um, chat. I have a question, Lori. Sure. All right. Hey, Kyle. Um, do you know what, I, I know we've talked about this before, but I was just curious to know, um, do you have a feeling for the future of HPC stack? Uh, is that going to be something that's going to be maintained or do you think we're moving to SPAC? I'm still a little bit confused about the difference between the two, sure. whether well, they can coexist or not, but yeah. Um, so we are currently maintaining and developing HPC stack. You know, we keep it up to date with the latest uh, developed for the UFS weather model. And, um, but we are exploring SPAC. It is, we actually, all the libraries have been merged into SPAC. The difference, they are very, very similar. Um, you know, a home, it, you know, it's an internal thing that we had and then we discovered SPAC and then so we're, um, so we don't have a, I think we're gonna be moving to SPAC once we can get all the things worked out, but that HPC stack is gonna be around for, you know, uh, a while yet, I would say. Okay, thanks. So um, there's one question on the um, Slack channel from June. Would you like to bring your question to this conversation? I don't have Slack opened. Oh, I, yeah. I, I was asking June if he wanted to um, talk about his question here. I think it might oh, be. Oh, oh that, uh, about, uh, con about containers? No, he had a question about uh, the various versions of NCEP Lives for the various applications for GF GSI, UFS, SRW, RRW. Um, is there a plan to like unify which NCEP Lives support which applications? Um, I'm not sure you know the answer to that. It's kind of a bigger question. Yeah, I don't understand the question. Uh, they're all pretty stable libraries and I mean, they all, all the same ones are used across all the applications, maybe the different versions, but um, that's the question, the different versions of them to, to unify them. Yeah, I think I can uh, oh, go ahead. expand a little bit. There, there's just a, I think most of this is mainly because due to the fact that the medium range weather app and short range weather app were released at such different times. And so the NSEP libraries, they are dependent on our various different versions um, that are kind of, because the MRW is older, it's using older versions of these libraries in sort of a frozen state. Um, and I don't know, we've, we're currently handling this with, uh, with release branches. Um, and those, um, I don't know if there have been any updates, but theoretically we will provide updates um, if they are necessary for bug fixes or what, or what have you to the NSEP libs um, in the future. I think that was getting at, at uh, what his question was asking. Right, and I think I would add that the, the biggest difference in these different versions is the build systems, right? Yes. So the MRW build system from two years ago looks quite different than HPC stack today, um, but the libraries don't change much over no. the years. Yeah. So once you've got the libraries, you could use the same library for each of the different systems. It's just building a library that's different, yeah? I think at one point there was sort of a rearrangement, a refactoring of the directory naming structure as well. So it might not be quite that simple, yes. but in concept that's true. Yeah, if you, the, you know, it might not be as uh, like unified as in you would have to, 
you know, go in and probably manually change some link flags, but if the libraries are there, you could make it work. The libraries themselves aren't different. The build system. The joy of symbolic links. Yes, but this should be more stable going forward. Um, I think we're in a pretty good spot with our build systems for everything now. Okay, um, Christina, would you like to ask your question in the group? Sure, I was just curious if you could speak to the possibility or possibly speak to uh, the difference in user experience when using HPC stack versus spec? Um, would it still be module based or is it something more akin to virtual environments or condo environments that you would get with like Python package managers? Um, you don't have things like environments. Um, SPAC is definitely more feature rich. It has, you know, I know you have SPAC environments and um, HPC stack, it provides you LMOD modules and it gives you a, um, if you don't use modules, just a big, you know, lib, big dump of libraries and they just have to point C make to. Um, so you were saying that SPAC does have a virtual environment type? Yes, it does. It's actually, oh, okay. oh yeah, yeah, yes, yes. SPAC does. It's called SPAC environments and it works just like um, like the Python environments and it uh, you know, puts everything in your environment and um, you know, builds everything. Okay, are there any other questions for Kyle? Because we're running a little bit ahead of schedule, um, we've been having a side conversation to um, rearrange the talks, the remaining talks a little bit um, and have uh, decided to have Ben Blake go next before our break because he has a fairly short topic. And then Tracy will go after a break with the unified post-processor talk. So if Ben, if you're ready and Kyle, you can stop sharing your screen and okay. then you can take it. All right, yeah, I'm ready to go. Sounds good. So I think, Kyle, you need to stop sharing. Okay. Um, there you go. Okay. Okay, I'm going to turn my camera off while I'm speaking, and then I can turn it back on later. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, looks good. Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Blake. Uh, I'm a support scientist at NOAA's Environmental Modeling Center, and I'll be talking to you all about generating graphics with the Python plotting packages that are available in the short range weather application. So I'll start off with a brief overview of what's actually included in the SRW app, then I will go over the details of how to run the Python scripts themselves. Then I have a few pretty pictures to show you all, some example plots of the model output you can generate with the scripts. And then I will go into a couple different ways that you can modify the scripts, which include modifying the plotting domain, as well as adding a new variable. And this plot on the right here is just a 10 meter wind speed plot from one of uh, EMC's real time parallels, our land DAX parallel, which includes data simulation uh, this forecast was initialized August 21st, 0Z, valid uh, the 22nd, 6Z. So it's a 30 hour forecast. And uh, this is of Hurricane Henri as it is approaching landfall on the east coast of the US. Okay, so there are, like I mentioned, there are two Python plotting scripts that are provided with the SRW app. And you can use those to generate plots from FV3, FV3LAM post process for two output. And the following variables are currently available, available in those scripts. So these are kind of common standard fields that folks generally tend to look at when you want to uh, gauge how well a model is performing. So uh, variables such as 2 meter temperature, dew point, 10 meter wind speed, 
a couple upper level fields, accumulated precip, reflectivity, and then a couple severe weather fields, Cape Sin, updraft helicity, and then also sea level pressure. However, uh, it's, these are certainly not the only fields that uh, folks may want to look at. So uh, towards the end of my talk, I will go over how to add a new variable to the plotting scripts. Oh, whoops. Okay, so the scripts themselves are located here. Uh, if you once you clone the SRW app, it will. If you run manage externals, you'll retrieve the regional workflow repository, and then within the USH Python directory is where the scripts are located. So the two <coughs> Python scripts are plot all vars and plot all vars diff. So the first one plots the output from a single model run on one panel, and the second script, the difference plotting script, actually plots the difference between two model runs. So that one has three panels. So the top two panels are for model runs one and two, and then the bottom panel is the difference between those two runs. Uh, note, if you are plotting the difference, the runs do need to be on the same domain and available for the same forecast hours. We also provide some sample submission scripts that are available for both Slurm and PBS. So on Hera, Jet, Orion, and Gaia, the job scheduler is Slurm. So you want to use the, the SQ job and SQ job diff submission scripts. And then on Cheyenne, which is the platform you guys are working on for the tutorial, you would use the Q sub submission scripts. And I generally recommend that when running these scripts that you do go ahead and submit them, submit them as a batch job rather than trying to run them interactively on a login node. Okay, so let's go into the details for how to actually run the scripts. So first you want to load the appropriate environment. Uh, the scripts do require Python 3 with both the PyGrib and Card5 packages. The Python environment has already been set up for you on all the level one platforms and it can be loaded as follows uh, for the different platforms listed there. However, if you use the batch submission scripts, which again is how I would recommend running these, then you actually do not need to do this step here. Okay, so to run the plot all vars script, which again creates plots for a single model run, there are six command line arguments that are required. So the first is just the cycle date and time of the model run that you have output for. So that's in year, month, day, hour format. Then you have your starting and ending forecast hours for which you want plots generated for. And then uh, forecast hour increments. So for instance, if you want plots generated every three hours, that would be three. And then you have to specify your experiment directory, which is where your post-processed post data are found. So that is kind of structured like this. So experiment directory within there, you have your cycle, year, month, day, hour directory, and then post PRD is where the UPP will generate uh, your grid to output. And I believe there is a talk now after me, after the break, which will be on the UPP. And then the final command line argument is CardPy directory. So this is the directory that contains the CardPy shape files, and they are used for plotting the background map images for the plots. And I'll say a little bit more about those in another slide or two here. So then if you want to run the difference plotting script, which creates pl difference plots for two model runs, uh, instead of six command line arguments, you now need seven. The one difference here being is instead of one experiment directory, you now have two experiment directories. So experiment dir one and experiment dir two. But otherwise, the Command line arguments are exactly the same for both scripts. All right, so if you, for instance, would like to plot output every six hours for forecast hours, let's say six through 48 from one model run that we initialized at August 21st on 0z, this is what you would do here. So you would do python plot all vars py, then your cycle date in year, month, day, hour format, then your starting forecast hour six, uh, ending forecast hour at 48, and then you want plots every six hours, so then you would have a six there. And then your path to your experiment directory here, I just said test conus three kilometers 
and then your path to the Cardify shapefiles. So those shapefiles, they are available on all of the level one platforms. I have the paths listed here, but if you are running uh, these scripts somewhere else, you can also download them for free at this link located at the bottom here. Oops. Okay, so this is the last slide with a lot of text and I promise I will show some cool plots. Um, so if you're creating plots for multiple forecast lead times and forecast variables, then the scripts should definitely be submitted through the batch system. And I generally would just recommend you do this anyway. Uh, so if you're on Herajet or INR Guy, you will use Slurm and you can submit the scripts using sbatch. And then if you're on Cheyenne, the job scheduler is PBS there, you would use QSub. Uh, multiple environment variables will need to be set prior to submitting the batch scripts. You can do this on the command line with either set env or export. And those two, uh, or those environment variables are home RRFS, which is just the path to your regional workflow directory. And then experiment directories also need to be specified. So if you're running the, uh, just the standard plot all of our script, you just do experiment dir, but if you're running the different script, you would do experiment dir one and experiment dir two, and then you would specify the path to those. Uh, the following variables listed here can also be modified in the batch script. So your cycle date, uh, your forecast start, forecast end. Uh, the forecast end is initially set to the length of the forecast, but if you, for instance, don't want plots going all the way out to the end of the forecast, and maybe you just want them out to forecast hour 12, then you could just change that variable to 12 in the batch script. And finally, the output files, which will be in PNG format, they will be located in the same directory as your grid two output, that post PRG directory, which uh, you specified as experimenter earlier on. Okay, so now I'm just gonna show a few example plots that you can generate using these scripts. So this is another 10 meter wind speed plot. Uh, this one is from a model run, uh, August 21st, ZRZ initialized and then it's valid 6Z, 6Z on the 22nd, so it's a 30-hour forecast. And this is uh, from EMC's real-time FB3 LAM parallel. And uh, you can see, uh, tropical, I think it was a tropical storm at this time, but tropical storm Henri is just offshore uh, the coast there of the Northeast US. Here is a 36-hour accumulated precipitation plot. Uh, this was from a model run initialized on September 1st, ZRZ and it's valid ending at September 2nd, 12Z. So this is a 36 hour accumulated precipitation and it's focused on the tropical remnants of Hurricane Ida as they made their way across the Eastern US and caused a lot of flooding, even some crazy looking tornadoes across the uh, New Jersey, New York area as well. Uh, this is a plot of two meter temperature over the conus and this is also during the time of Hurricane Ida, except this is a 21 hour forecast. Uh, I thought this plot was kind of cool just because it shows across the Southern US, you can see some cold pools from convection there. Also the relatively cooler air over the Eastern US where the remnants of Ida are located. And then you can also sort of see the effect of orography across the Western US where the mountainous terrain is located and you'll see uh, cooler temperatures there too. So I just thought that was kind of a cool plot to show. And then here is a plot of surface-based cape and sin. So the uh, cape is color filled in the background and then the sin is the hatches. So the hatches, different hatches symbolize different values of sin. So if you have greater than 500 joules per kilogram, you would have a star there. So there's some values here. And then uh, between 250 and 500 joules per kilogram is a plus. Uh, between 100 and 250 is the forward slash, and then the small dot is between 25 and 100. So this is just kind of a unique way of getting Cape and Sim to appear uh, on the same plot. Uh, however, if the Sim contours are a little, or the Sim hatching is a little distracting, you can easily remove that and just have the Cape. Or if you want to, to color fill Sim and not have Cape, that's also a possibility as well. So this was just a way to have both on the same plot. Okay, so now I'll have a couple difference plots to show. So this is a another 10 meter wind speed, but it has the difference plot between two model runs. So on the top left, we have EMC's 
FV3 LAM real-time parallel. On the top right, we have our LAM DAX parallel. So this one includes data simulation. The one on the left does not. And you can see on the bottom panel, which plots the differences between them. There are some notable differences in uh, wind speed, especially around the eye of the storm, which show that the run, the model run with data simulation produced much stronger wind speeds than the run without data simulation, which I thought was pretty interesting, could be worth looking into. I'm not sure which model run is more correct here. I'm probably leaning more towards the DA run because it looks more realistic, but again, not entirely sure, just without doing any verification. <laughs> uh, so here's another type of plot you can make, a 500 millibar height, wind, and vorticity plot. So the vorticity is color filled in the background. Uh, the 500 millibar heights in decameters are the black contour lines, and then the 500 millibar winds are the wind barbs that are located on the images. And the, the difference between the 500 millibar heights is located on the bottom panel here. So you can see there are some differences in heights around where uh, Henri was located at this time. And here is uh, just a two meter temperature difference plot. Um, so there's definitely a lot of large differences showing up across the southern and Southwest US related to uh, convection that was ongoing at this time. All right, so now I'm just going to go into a couple different ways that you can actually modify the scripts. Uh, so the first is just uh, how to modify the plotting domain. So the plots are generated over the CONUS by default. As you saw, all the examples I showed were over the CONUS, but for instance, if you want to look at an interesting weather event, then you certainly would want to look at uh, maybe a zoomed in smaller localized area. So there are two ways you can do this with the plotting scripts. Uh, the first is to, you can utilize the minimum and maximum latitude and longitude that are in the grid two file. And to do this, you would set domains equal to regional in the plotting scripts. And then there's code here on the right that basically determines the minimum and maximum values that would be used in plotting the domain. Uh, the second way to do this, which is what I did for the examples I'm going to show, is you can <clears throat> add a user-specified domain. Now, so for that, you need to define uh, the lower left, upper right, and center latitude and longitude. And so I did that for both Henri and Ida. Uh, note that this process does involve a little trial and error to get exactly what you want. But um, I, for doing this, I generally just make a sample or a simple plotting script, which plots maybe one variable, and then it runs very quickly. And then I can easily tell whether or not I need to modify these values at all. All right, so here are a couple examples from the two domains that I showed on the previous slide. So on the left are 10 meter wind speed plots of Henri that are zoomed in over the region of interest. So um, it's definitely a lot easier to see the large scale differences here um, on the zoomed in view rather than on the conus view. So that is kind of nice. And obviously the color scale uh, goes off the charts here. So maybe if I wanted to remake this plot, I would change the color scale a little bit just to see the magnitude of the, these differences here. And then on the right, we have a uh, 30 hour accumulated precipitation. And this is with the zoomed in Ida domain. So you can more clearly tell that there are amounts approaching or slightly greater than 10 inches in this 30 hour period that fell, at least according to the uh, model runs here. And I believe there were some amounts across uh, Northern New Jersey that were approaching eight inches for the storm total. So that might not be too far off actually in those totals. Okay, and then the last thing I wanna go over here is how to add a new variable to the plotting scripts. Uh, to do this, you can use the PyGrib tool. Uh, so what uh, you can use that for is to print the grid keys for the variable of interest. Uh, so in your grid file, you can obtain a listing of what's in there just using wgrid2 on the command line. And then uh, you can figure out uh, which grid record number you're interested in. So the example I'm going to go over is precipitation rate. So if you, if you locate which number it is in the file, let's just say it's uh, grid record 45, for example, then you would be able to run this code here to determine what the grid keys are. So to do this, uh, to run this example code on grid record 45, you would just do 
Python, and then the name of the script here, I'm calling it out print pygrave message details.py. And then you the path to your grip2 file and then the grip record number in the file. So again, I'm just saying it's number 45 in the file here. And then so for my example, I'm going to plot precipitation rate, uh, especially with Hurricane Ida with the great amount of rain that fell. I thought it would be interesting to see uh, what plots of precipitation rate would look like. So uh, I followed the code on the previous slide and printed out the grid keys. So here are two of them. Uh, so the name is the one that I'm actually going to use for reading in the variable. And it said the name was precipitation with a capital P and then rate with a lowercase r. So that's what I used down below. And then for the units, I also wanted to look at those because then I wanted to convert precipitation rate from a kilogram meter per square meter per second into millimeters per hour, which is a more recognizable unit. So I've, then I multiplied by 3600 here to do that conversion. So uh, the script changes for adding a new variable, they are required in two places in the Python script. So you would read in the variable using the grid keys. Uh, so here is an example line of doing that. Uh, there's other lines in the Python scripts which show how to read in the other variables. So it's kind of similar to that. You can follow the logic there. And then again, I multiply by 3600 to do the unit conversion. And then the more complicated part would be to add a block of code for actually plotting the new variable. So what I recommend you do here is you start with code that already exists in the script for a different variable, and then you would modify that as needed. So I will briefly go over how an example of how I did that on the next couple slides here. So this is the code that is in the script for applying composite reflectivity. So at the top, you just have a print statement. It's the script is now working on composite reflectivity. Uh, this line here gets rid of the color bar and uh, plot from the previous image. And then here located in the middle here are some specific of values that are needed for plotting reflectivity itself. And then the actual plotting routine is located down here. So if I go to the next slide, uh, this is how I modified that code. So I basically copied the code for composite reflectivity and moved it just below where that was located in the scripts for precipitation rate. So I changed all the labels from composite reflectivity to precipitation rate, uh, changed the variable name. Oh, Oh no, it's highlighted here. I changed the variable name from ref C, I believe, is what it was before. Let's see, yeah, ref C, I changed that to P rate in the couple locations where that was. And then as far as the color bars go and the contour levels, you can specify those here for the variable that you want. So for precipitation rate, I decided I wanted to contour from a hundredth of an inch to, uh, or not a hundredth of an inch, hundredth of a millimeter per hour to 100 millimeters per hour. And then this is the color bar that I use with the colors listed there. And then the only other thing you have to do again is to change maybe some color bar options down below here. But otherwise, uh, once you do that, then you should be able to plot the variable. So this is what I came up with for using the scripts in the SRW app uh, for precipitation rate. So on the left, we have a conus y view of p rate. And then on the right, we have a zoomed in view over uh, the Ida domain for uh, p rate. So you can see there are actually some values that are greater than 100 millimeters per hour, which equates to greater than four inches per hour, which is uh, quite a lot. So um, I think that's all I have. Thank you for listening. And uh, I like Lord of the Rings, so I had to include this here. But um, my email is listed there if anyone has any questions, but that's all that I had. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ben. I think some of the students have already had a chance to play with the plotting scripts in the practical sessions. And if not, they can do that this afternoon. Does anybody okay. have any questions for Ben right now? Um, go ahead, Julie. Uh, nice talk. So I'm just uh, wondering uh, how easy it is to modify scripts to uh, support or to plot in the NSCF file, uh, not just on the, say, not, not necessarily on the red component grid, but also on the native grid. Say if a user want to look at NSCF file for the initial condition for the product. 
Oh, so there there would be a little bit of work required for that. Uh, the scripts right now are just by default they plot the grid two output. So if it would be of interest to have scripts that plot from the net CDF output, we could uh, include that capability in the uh, SRWF going forward, and then that would potentially be pretty helpful, I think. So that's definitely something we could consider adding. But yeah, the current version of the script just supports uh, the grid two output, which is generated from uh, running the workflow. Yeah, thanks, man. Anything else? To David Wright, he helps a lot with uh, putting these Python flying scripts together. So David, if you're on the call, uh, thank you <laughs> for all your help. Okay, if that's um, all for now, we will take a break for about 20 minutes and return at 11 a.m. Mountain Time, whatever that is in your time zone, and we'll finish up with Tracy's talk about the post-processor. Thanks, everybody. Should I wait until exactly 11 or go ahead and go now? Um, I imagine that uh, Lori will come on and introduce you. Um, I'm not quite sure. So, <laughs> yeah, let's wait a minute or two and get every, give everybody a chance to get back. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a chance to stretch your legs a little bit. It's been a long three days um, to sit and watch videos, but hopefully they've been helpful and useful. Um, our last speaker for today, before we go into the practical session this afternoon, is Tracy Hurtnecki, and she's going to be talking about uh, the unified post processor and how it fits in with this short range weather app. Um, go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, thank you, Lori. Um, yeah, I'll be talking about NCEP's Unified Post Processor, um, aka the UPP. And uh, first, I want to give a shout out to the rest of the awesome UPP team, Kate Fassell, Kai Wong, Mike Kavulich, and Lori Carson. All right, so this is a brief outline. So I'll talk about an overview of the UPP, its functions and features. Uh, followed by the components, which include the inputs and outputs of UPP. And then I'll go over some optional things, such as how you might customize UPP um, from the default settings, um, as well as regridding and how you might use those in downstream application, followed by uh, ongoing activities of the UPP software. So UPP was developed at the National Centers for Environmental Prediction. It is used operationally to post-process forecast output for a variety of models, for example, the GFS, the HER, RAP, uh, and NAM, um, as well as others. And it is also included, of course, as the post-processing component for the UFS weather applications. So it was part of the UFS MRW uh, weather application uh, V1.1, which was released uh, last year in October. And the particular UPP release tag for that was the UFS V1.1. And then for the UFS short range weather application version 1.0.1, which was released uh, just last week, uh, the particular UPP release tag for that is UPP underscore V9.0.1. Uh, support and documentation for UPP is provided through the Developmental Testbed Center, the DTC. And here I've provided a couple uh, helpful links uh, that include the user's guide uh, for the UPP, how to uh, 
and, and, and the user's guide shows how you might build and run um, standalone, um, which is um, separate from the UFS SRW, but it also includes a, a lot of information on um, the inputs and outputs and components, features and such. Um, and then the uh, other link is the UFS Community Support Forum. And if you have any just general UPP questions, you can go here and ask them. Or if you have trouble uh, with it within one of the applications, you can post in this form as well. Uh, community users are also encouraged to um, help uh, answer questions on the, the forum if they know the answer as well. So the UPP will ingest your FE3 LAM forecast files in uh, net CDF format. Um, also, it um, can ingest the binary NEMS MPIO, MPIIO format as well. But in the SRW and in our practical session, these files are in net CDF format. It performs vertical interpolation from the model's native vertical coordinate system to the NWS standard output levels, for example, to pressure levels, height, or other levels and surfaces. It produces numerous fields and diagnostic output quantities, um, just like those that you would see operationally. And it incorporates the Joint Center for da Satellite Data Assimilation Community Radiative Transfer Model, the CRTM, to compute derived satellite brightness temperatures for various instruments and channels. It is an MPI parallel code, and it also outputs uh, your requested fields in standard WMO uh, group two format. These are just some example fields that can be generated by UPP. It is by means not a, a complete list. So for example, you can do temperature, uh, height, humidity, wind, uh, cloud, and microphysical micro uh, parameters on isobaric levels. Uh, you could do sea level pressure, um, as well as shelter level, uh, temperature, humidity, and winds, uh, precipitation related fields, uh, planetary boundary layer related fields, uh, various diagnostic products, for example, relative humidity, cape or verticity, um, as well as many others, um, radiative and surface fluxes, uh, a number of cloud related fields, aviation products, as well as synthetic satellite products. So I'm gonna put a disclaimer on the synthetic satellite products in that the short range weather app does not currently uh, link the files for outputting these. However, uh, in the practical session, I go over how to do this. Um, so tune in for the practical session if you would like to learn how to do that within the short range weather app itself. Uh, I've included a link here for a list of available fields that are in the uh, UP that are available for UPP, um, and this is within the UPP documentation. So UPP, UPP can output on a number of vertical levels. Um, it can output on all of the available model levels that the model output is on. It can output in 47 uh, isobaric levels. Uh, those are listed here. Uh, 15 different flight or wind energy levels, a complete list you can find in the UPP do documentation. It's not the full list. Uh, soil layers, of course, this varies depending on your LSM that you used. Uh, low, mid, and high cloud layers. Uh, six different PBL layers. Uh, each of these are averaged over a 30 uh, millibar depth layer. Uh, two AGL ra radar reflectivity levels at one and four kilometers, as well as other surface and shelter levels. Uh, this uh, schematic shows the components of the UPP. Uh, within the red box is the UPP system itself. Um, so uh, the main driver of UPP is NSEP post. This is the executable um, that is built when you build UPP. And uh, to run it, it requires uh, a couple of different files that you need to provide. First of all, uh, the FE3 LAM model output files um, are used uh, as the input files for the NSEP post processor. <clears throat> 
And then it also uses a control file. Uh, this is called the postx config, and it is a text file. This lists all of the output fields that the user wants output in the UPP. And so you run uh, the UPP and um, your output files will be in a GRIB2 format. And with these GRIB2 files, you can do a variety of uh, downstream applications, uh, for example, regridding, a visualization, or a verification. So one thing that I'll note is the UFS application workflows do create all the necessary input files and data links that are required for UPP to run. So you don't have to set this up yourself. So for example, in the short range weather application, the Rakota workflow will link everything appropriately that you need. Um, I'll go over in detail each of the uh, four input files. Um, so UPP requires the following input files that are all created and linked within the application workflow. So the model output file, um, either in binary NumsIO, MPIO, IO, or in SCDF format for the short range weather out, uh, application, uh, the format model format is an SCDF. An ITAG file, uh, this is essentially the UPP name list uh, control file. This is the postx config fb 3 lam text file. This lists the desired fields for output. And then finally, additional data files, uh, for example, the micro lookup tables, as well as coefficient files for satellite. And as I had mentioned previously, uh, currently the SRW uh, application does not link the coefficient files. But as I said, in the practical session, I go through how you might link these files in the UPP run script so that you can output satellite fields. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail on the first uh, three uh, items listed here. So the model output, UPP ingests your FE3LAM model output in that CDF uh, format. Um, and it uses the NSEP libs WARF.io library package to do this. Uh, by default, the UPP reads a set list of fields from the model output files for basic diagnostics. This includes uh, your pressure, temperature, uh, specific humidity, uh, and such. Um, and so you need all of these uh, fields available within the model output for UPP to run correctly, otherwise it will fail. Um, Model output is found in the experiment directory for each initialization and consists of two files. And this model output is generated when you uh, do the run forecast portion of the Rakoto workflow. Um, so the two files that are uh, created are the Dyne uh, uh, forecast hour net CDF. Uh, and these are 3D fields on model levels in the PHI and the forecast hour net CDF. These are 2D fields and surface at the surface and at other levels. So both of those are used as input into the UPP. The second um, input file is the ITAG file. Uh, this ITAG is um, automatically generated um, by the application workflow for each forecast hour. And then it is read by UPP. This is an example of the short range weather um, ITAG. And so on the left here are the elements that are, that are generated within the ITAG. So your first element is your model output file with fields on model levels. Um, the second element is the format of your model output, which is in the CDF. The third element is the format of the UPP output. Currently only GRIP2 is available for UPP output. Uh, the next one is the forecast valid time. Uh, note that this is the uh, valid time for the forecast that you are post-processing and it is not your start or initialization time. Next is the model name. Um, for the FE3LAM, this is called FE3R. Um, and then finally, the model output file um, with fields on surface and other 2D levels. So again, you don't need to generate that yourself. It is generated automatically um, with the workflow. Okay, the control file. 
uh, UPP reads a control file to, to, to determine which fields uh, to post-process. Uh, there are default, default control files um, that are used within the UFS weather applications. However, these can be customized um, to add or remove fields or levels as the user desires. So the default uh, SRW control file is located in the EMC post PARM directory of the UFS SRW um, application source code. And it is called specifically for the FE3LAM, the post xconfig FE3LAM.txt. Uh, this is a flat text file that is used to post process the model output for the FE3LAM. This flat text file is not user friendly. And so you don't actually modify this file directly for customization, but I will go over that um, here in a bit on how to do the customization. Finally, the UPP output. UPP output files are going to be found in your experiment directory for each initialization. I know for the practical session, you're only running one initialization. Um, and then you'll find that under the post PRD with the following naming conventions. Um, this is uh, the, the first one on the left is the output from uh, run forecast, running the forecast. And then it is linked to a more descriptive file name um, on the right here, where domain is the domain that you're running your forecast on. So if you're running for the her domain, uh, for example, like we're doing in the practical session, that'll be called her and then your cycle, your forecast hour. Um, and it'll have both, uh, both of these files um, for each forecast hour available in your post PRD directory. So the output from the UPP is in the standard group two format. It includes all the fields that requested in the control file. So if you notice that an expected field isn't in the output, it's possibly due to your specific model configuration. Perhaps um, the field that you're requesting isn't available for that model specifically or uh, physics or, or something else. Uh, for the SRW application, the output projection is on a 25, 13 and three kilometer uh, Lambert conformal grid. Um, depending on the grid length that is chosen. And those are the group two files. If you want to regrid to another projection or a different domain, you can use third party software called WGRIP2. And I do have an example of that as well in the pr practical session to how to do that. All right, so you can go with the default uh, parameter file that's used by the short range weather application. But I just wanted to include that you can customize the UPP output to add or remove uh, fields or levels. So for the UFS SRW uh, V1.0.1 customization uh, of UPP output is functional. Um, all files uh, utilized for customization um, of the parameter files are found in the SRW application code directory. Um, under this EMC post PARM directory within the UFS SRW app source code directory. Um, so the first file um, that I'll talk about is the FE3LAM, and I'll go into more detail on all three of these files in the next slides as well. The FE3LAM.xml is an XML uh, file that lists all the requested fields for output, and this is the file that users will actually um, modify. The FE3LAM post available fields XML is an XML file that lists all the available fields for the FE3LAM and details for group two output and uh, tables. You wouldn't generally uh, ever modify this XML unless you're doing uh, development. And then finally, the post xconfig FE3LAM text file this is the file that's read directly by UPP. You don't modify this file. It is actually created from the XML files and it lists all the requested fields for output that you had defined in your fe3lam.xml. And as I said, this is read directly by UPP. So I wanna make a note that um, if you do customize the parameter files, 
uh, it requires knowledge about what variables can actually be output for your particular model and configuration. So just keep that in mind when you're doing this. So into some more details on what's in the content of these files. So for the fe3lam.xml, as I mentioned before, this is the user modified XML file. It lists all of the desired fields and levels that you want output by the UPP. I wanna note that formatting in these files is important. So just use the file as a guide um, to format anything you add to be the same. Within these files, you'll see a number of parameter blocks um, for each variable that you want to output. Within these parameter blocks, um, you always have the short name. This is the character name that describes the product or the field. You might also have, um, depending on your variable, a vertical coordinate levels um, that you desire to be output. Um, this is relevant for temperature, for example, on isobaric surface, where you would want to specify which vertical uh, pressure levels you want uh, this variable to be output on. And I had it listed, there was what, uh, oh gosh, I forget, 47 different levels that you could output for isobaric surface. So here we're only picking four. Um, and then the other um, element here within the PARM block, of this XML is the scale and that is grid precision packing. Generally, I tell users not to um, modify that value. Um, you could increase it um, to increase your precision that could uh, also um, increase your file size. Um, generally, the values that are in there are, are good enough. The second file, which was the FE3LAM post available fields XML. This was the XML that listed all of the available fields, as well as some more details for your group two tables and output. You generally won't modify this file unless you're doing development. And by development, I mean, you're adding a completely new variable to UPP for post-processing, um, something that's not currently available in UPP and then you would need to add that variable to this field. So that's the only time you would really want to modify this, uh, the file. Um, again, each variable or field is, has a separate param block here um, with uh, the first element in that being the unique UPP ID. So UPP uses this unique ID uh, throughout the source code for each of the um, variables. And the second line is the short name, uh, as we saw in the user customizable uh, XML. This is character name describing the product or field. The second or the third one is the, uh, the P name. Um, and this is the field abbreviation used by GRIP2 libraries, it is also the name that will show up in your WGRIP2 output if you're doing a, like a WGRIP2 um, on the file, um, that's how it'll show up. And then the second one is the vertical coordinate type, or the next one, uh, vertical coordinate type for each field. Um, and in this case, um, this also has the level for the specific coordinate level type. And this is because for this particular variable temperature on specific height above ground, it's for two meters. And so the two meters is listed here in this field. And you can't put another level for that because it's specific to two meters temperature. Um, and that is the only time you would actually use level in this post available fields.xml. Um, and then the grid precision packing, which I described previously, um, which is the same. If you um, change the value for in, in the epi3 uh, lamb xml the user defined xml um, then it would override the value that's in the post available fields xml all right um, so how do you actually create that flat text file that upp actually reads so um, this this file if you want to modify um, 
or customize your UPP output, then you would want to modify your fe3lam.xml. And to do that, you'll need to run the following steps to convert to a new flat text file that contains these changes. So you would cd to your parameter directory file. You would then edit your fe3lam.xml to add or remove fields or levels. I suggest making a copy of this XML um, in case you make any mistakes um, before you edit it. And then finally, you would run this uh, Perl script. And the arguments for the Perl script include your uh, customized fe3lam.xml, the post available fields.xml, and then um, the output is the postx config or the output file name, which would be the postx config text file. So the Perl program uses both the fe3lam XML and fe3lam post available fields.xml uh, to create this new uh, postx config text file. All right, so you have a, a customized uh, text file. How do you use this in the SRW application? So to use a customized flat text file, you would need to add the following lines to UFS uh, uh, SRW config.sh file. So this uh, config file, and you would need to add these two lines. The first one is use custom post config file. This is a Boolean. You set it to either true or false. If you have it set to true, um, then that tells the application that you want to use your custom flat file. The second line is the custom post config FP, stands for full path or file path, um, as Gerard had mentioned, I think on Monday. And then that would be the entire path to your customized postx config text file. Um, this path must contain the file name. Once you do that, you can then generate your workflow using the generate FE3 workflow script and then run the case workflow as usual. And UPP will use this custom flat text file in the, in the specified path that you listed here. Um, I just wanna note that if you do set this to true and the file path isn't found, then an error, error will occur when trying to generate the short range weather application workflow. So, um, all right, so that's, that's the end of how you would go about customizing a UPP output. Um, so you can do some optional things with the UPP output that's in GRIP2 format. You can regrid using WGRIP2. Um, so as I mentioned before, UPP output for the uh, short range weather application is on a Lambert conformal grid, and it can be interpolated to a new projection uh, using the WGRIP2 utility. And this is a a third party utility that you would have to download yourself. It is not included in the UPP uh, package. So the generic usage command is wgroup2 in file, and that's the input file, your, uh, UP, your group2 input file from UPP. Um, new grid wins where W is either earth or grid, and earth means that U wind is eastward and V wind is northward. And grid means, for example, that U wind goes from grid IJ to I plus one J. And then uh, specifying the new grid specifications using new grid and the A, B, C options here, where A is the grid type with uh, any parameters that are needed for that grid type. B is your X or longitude grid specifications, and C is your Y or latitude grid specifications. And then you would specify an output file. Um, a more detailed description of WGRIP2 and how to use it for regridding is um, provided uh, with this link here at the bottom. This is a, just a quick example of uh, a latitude longitude grid. So, here, um, your WGRIP2 uh, grid specifications, your A for the grid type would be lat lon. Uh, your B is your longitude um, uh, specifications, and your C is your latitude specifications. 
where uh, these get break down even further. So for your longitude specifications, uh, you need the longitude of your first grid point in degrees, the number of longitudes, and then the grid resolution in degree of longitude, and then the same for your latitude. Um, as I mentioned before, there is an example um, to actually do some hands-on of um, regridding to uh, like a smaller domain in the practical session. All right, UPP can also be used for another other variety of downstream applications. Um, since it is in a uh, group two output that is widely used for various uh, uh, applications, uh, you can use it for visualization or plotting software. And Benjamin Blake already went over, um, for example, using Python to output uh, your group two output from UPP. Um, or you can use it for verification, for example, the model evaluation tools that are developed here at the DTC as well. Um, if you wanted to compare your model output to observations, um, so um, that would be the software um, that you would use, um, that I would recommend using, so. Great, and that's all I have. Um, so some ongoing activities um, for UPP. Uh, there's been a recent initiative to further unify the UPP um, by merging separate repositories um, and consolidating them into a single uh, repository, and then consolidating directory structures and building methods between the applications as well. We also had a refactor project that's ongoing with EMC. Uh, year one is complete, and those activities included cleaning up and modernizing the code, uh, developing some reusable, reusable and interoperable modules, and documenting variable dependencies. We're currently in year two of this project, and that includes increasing parallelism by adding decomposition in the X direction. While I did say that UPP was an MPI parallel code, it is only decomposed in the Y direction currently. So that is something that's currently being done uh, right now. And then validation and evaluation by code managers and developers of all models supported by UPP. Right, and that is all I have, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, thanks, Tracy. I don't see any questions in the chat, but there are a couple on Slack. Um, Gerard, if you'd like to go ahead and um, ask your question here, the whole group can listen. Sure. I was just wondering, there was a discussion a couple of days ago as to why we have a in the right component, why are we still um, regridding to one of the other, like the Lambert conformal or rotated lat long grids? And um, so we were wondering, I think before it was the reason was that UPP cannot uh, process the native grid. Is that still true? And if so, why? I was wondering. Yeah, that is true. I don't know the reason why, actually. Okay. Hopefully that will come at some point. Then we don't we can skip the regridding step and give people the native output, you know, because a lot of times that they're more interested in that if they're debugging, for example, or at least give them that option. But, yeah, okay, and thanks. I honestly, I honestly yeah. don't know if that is um, something that that will be developed in the future either. Um, I don't know if anybody else within the UPP team is on and has anything to add to that. Yeah, just to expand on the discussion um, that some of us have had offline, um, that this is something that is a known feature request. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have, as far as I know, we don't have a specific timeline on it, but it is something we're planning on including eventually. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mike. Okay, there's one more question from Chong Shi, but he says he doesn't have the mic set up. Um, so I'll read the question, although I'm not sure I understand it. So we may need some more information. Um, can UPP also deal with the GRIP2 files from SRW post processing or only the FE3 outputs? I mean, UPP doesn't read GRIP2 as input, right? Right, no, UPP won't you, uh, read the GRIP2. In, as an input. So I guess I'm understanding he wants to read 
in the group two files into UPP? I'm not sure. So yeah. we'll see if some more discussion comes. Oh, yes. He says yes. So the SRW post processing is UPP and it generates those GRIP2 files. Right. So I don't think you'd want to read them in again to you. Right. That, that's just kind of how I understood it as yeah, well. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for Tracy? Okay, I think that looks like it. Um, our, our schedule is to take a long lunch break today and um, let everybody uh, get, take a rest from their computer screens for a while and come back at 1.15 Mountain Time, which is about an hour and 40 minutes from now. Um, so if that sounds good, we'll come back and um, the, the team here will be online to answer questions. You can follow along on the day three exercises, which include some of the customizations that Tracy talked about um, and learn some of the nuances of um, changing things in the short range weather app. <laughs>